Very good. And we welcome you to this meeting of the Community Bible Baptist Church. It's the meeting of the Community Bible Baptist Church. The church is not this building. We are the church. We meet here. We're so glad you joined us. Take your hymnal if you would, please. Stand with me. We'll turn to hymn number 119. Hymn number 119. And as soon as I can, if I can have one of the fellows turn on this uh, the monitor over here, that would be great. Hymn number 119. It may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Let's sing the last verse, O oh, joy, O oh, delight, should we go without dying, no sickness, no sadness, no dread, and no crying. Caught up through the clouds with our Lord in a glory when Jesus receives his own. We'll sing the last verse, ready? Oh joy, oh delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread, and no crying. Caught up through the clouds with the Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. Oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song? Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. Good. Let's take your hymn and we'll turn to hymn number 125. Hymn number 125. Marvelous message we bring. Glorious carol we sing. Wonderful word of the King. Jesus is coming again. Marvelous message we bring. Glorious carol we sing. Wonderful word of the King. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming. and flower exclaim mountain and meadow the same all earth and heaven proclaim Jesus is coming again coming again coming again maybe morning maybe noon maybe evening and maybe soon Troubles all past, crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming
I don't know about you tonight, but I believe that day is coming soon. It's coming very soon. This past week, my aunt went to be with the Lord, and uh, that means my grandparents and both my dad and my aunt, that whole household is gone on ahead. And that's going to be a sweet day when we see these loved ones again. And I'm thankful for that. Well, if it's your first time here or first time in a long time, we want to welcome you tonight. If you just slip up your hand, we don't want to embarrass you at all, but we do want to thank you for being here. And uh, there's just a card in that information packet. If you'd fill it out and drop it in the offering plate a little bit later, we'd appreciate it. Well, we've got a great night in store for us tonight. It looks like we've already had some great music. The choir's about to sing. We've got some special music lined up. Then we have Pastor Wiley and his wife are here from Palm Harbor, and we're looking forward to what God has from him. And then we're going to eat ice cream. I mean, it's just kind of a grand slam. <laughs> it's going to be great. But let's just start the service off in prayer and ask God to bless. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Father, I pray that you'd be with our speaker tonight. Father, I pray that you'd calm our hearts. Father, help us to hear from you. And Father, I pray that you would be with the, the music and the message. Father, help it to stir us to do more for you. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be a pastor tonight as he's been traveling, getting ready to preach. And Father, just be with him. Fill him with your power. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There we go. Let's all be stand and we'll shake, shake each other's hands. Make sure that you greet the visitors and people that are first, first time visitors.
All right, as you make your way back to your seats, let's turn to hymn number two. Hymn number two, the words will also be on the screen. Hymn number two, oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. Hymn number two, when we see Christ, ready? Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. Ready, here we go. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. Who knows our deepest care? Just go to seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storms forever Cross the great be seated. Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect by thy saving power, hear my plea, O King. O Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand.
Let me travel in thy light divine that I might see the blessed way. Keep me that I will be holy thine and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take a stand. As I onward go and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy saving power. Hear my plea, O King. O Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Times when you sing or you play up here, you're not sure how it sounds, but that sounded pretty good from where I was, guys. That was really good. First time they've all played together and sung, and uh, we had uh, several more over there with the piano, with the bass, and that was awesome. That was awesome. Well, get your Bibles out. We're so privileged to have uh, good churches and good pastors in our area, and uh, tonight is no exception. Uh, Brother Wiley, we've enjoyed getting to meet you. And we're looking forward to what God has for you. Pastor Stance was probably watching online, so if you want to greet him, I know he wanted to be here, but it's all yours. Well, we appreciate the invitation to be able to be here. And uh, I wish I could arrange for other pastors to come in and preach in my pulpit while I was out uh, in different places. I know this is just an excuse for Brother Stancil if he's watching. Uh, to be able to get out, uh, I'm just going to start calling other pastors in the air and saying, I'm going to be out of town. I think it's God's will for you to come over uh, our way and uh, be in our church and preach for us. But uh, I hope things are well with him. We're just getting to know uh, him a little bit better. and We appreciate his spirit, uh, his desire to uh, be a servant. We certainly are appreciative of the offer uh, that has been made. Uh, some folks coming up our way. We're uh, getting ready for a conference uh, here in about three weeks. And uh, some are coming up next Saturday to pass out some flyers and distribute. We've got some things in the mail on the way to us that should be here on Monday. And so uh, the timing couldn't be better. The Lord orchestrated all of that. And uh, we're so thankful for it. And uh, glad to be here tonight. We uh, uh, <clears throat> just familiarizing ourselves. I've uh, been here a couple of times and starting to see some familiar faces. And so that's a good thing. Um, Brother Mark, I've known uh, Brother Mark for a long, long time. Um, and uh, we, I did not know he was here. I, I had seen him uh, back maybe six or seven months ago when we first, uh, first started attending some fellowships. And uh, Brother Mark was uh, in Bible college for a long, long time. And um, he was one of those that one of those guys that, you know, fit four years into seven or eight uh, kind of things. He was cramming it all in. And uh, he had we I went to Bible college with him. And then uh, not long after that, my sister in law is a couple years uh, younger than I am. She went to Bible college with him. And uh, <clears throat> then my brother, who's nine years my junior, went to Bible college with him. And um, I couldn't believe it, uh, that, that we all went to Bible college with the same guy. So we give him a hard time. We certainly appreciate him, and uh, he seems to be fitting in well here. Just don't know how long you're going to stay, brother, uh, in that uh, we're, we're glad you're here. If you got the Bible tonight, I want you to open it with me to Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. Let me say to you, church, while you're turning there, I appreciate your investment in young people. Uh, I know that you, uh, your pastor is leading you uh, in a vision, a desire to, uh, to do more for uh, young people, uh, for this young adult ministry that started here. We sent some of our guys down for uh, the Single Vision Conference. They came back charged up, and uh, we are in the process, the beginning stages, of duplicating some things that you're doing here, uh, taking the best of what we 
we've seen and uh, putting that, implementing that in our ministry with a young adult ministry that we're starting up our way. We believe that's necessary. Uh, we don't want to lose those young people as they're leaving high school and going into those uh, very important college and post-college years. And so we're thankful for the vision of your pastor and for your support of that vision in making that possible. Daniel chapter number three this evening. And uh, if you're in the habit of standing for God's word, would you do that this evening as we read Daniel chapter three? We'll begin reading in verse number four, a familiar passage of scripture, a familiar story for many of you this evening. The Bible says in Daniel 3, verse 4, Then in herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds. I don't know why they just don't say all the instruments. Um, I, I love the word of God. I don't know why, they, why the Lord, all the instruments, okay? And all kinds shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should, they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. Thankful, Lord, for its teaching, for its truth. I pray in these next few moments that, Lord, you would grant unction from the Spirit of God to be able to preach, to communicate to these dear people the truth that you've put in my heart this evening that is rooted firmly in your word. Thank you, God, for the, the, the willingness of these men to stand 
when no one else was willing to stand. And we believe, Lord, that those days are coming for us who know you as Savior when we will have to stand when no one else is willing to stand. Dear God, strengthen our resolve and our desire to serve you. And I pray, God, tonight that we might leave here with something from your word that would encourage us and take us into the week, Lord, on fire for you. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We've all been inspired by those that have stood for their faith. Our lives are better because of the stories we have heard of others who have stood strong in the face of opposition. Uh, we've all heard the stories of people who stood up recently. There was a young man who was told uh, by, the, by the administration that he could not pray at his graduation. Uh, the viral on YouTube went viral as uh, people were watching all over the country as this young man in defiance tore up the speech that was uh, actually approved by the administration and went on to share his faith and pray at the baccalaureate. We're grateful for those who are willing to stand up and it inspires us to do more as we look at them we see ourselves and we see sometimes the people that we want to be when we see them doing the things that take great bravery, that take great courage. Uh, we are inspired by the things that we've seen down through history. I was reading about uh, a Christian martyr in Africa by the name of Perpetua. Perpetua, the story of Perpetua, so inspired the early Christians that Augustine warned against viewing her story as equal to Scripture. When they looked at her, they said, this lady is amazing. What she did, her resolve, we want that to be us. And they begin to venerate her in such a way that they begin looking at her story on the same plane as what we see here in Daniel chapter number 3. The story of Perpetua is this. She was born about A.D. 176 in Carthage, growing up in a well-to-do family. Her father wasn't a Christian, but her brothers and mother were devoted to Christ. Perpetua, bright and attractive, gained a good education and a husband, then a baby boy. In 202, Emperor Sentimus Severius issued an edict, an edict against Christians, and presently Perpetua and four other Christians were placed under house arrest. When her father begged her to recant, she pointed to a water pot and asked, Father, do you see this vessel? Can it be called by any other name than what it is? So also I cannot call myself by any other name than what I am, a Christian. She was moved to prison where her father again visited her, begging her with sobs to renounce her faith. She refused. Perpetua and a handful of other believers were then tried in the marketplace where again her father appeared carrying her infant son and begging her to free herself. Sentenced to torture and execution, the Christians were dragged back to prison. When she asked to see her baby a final time, she was refused the request. Perpetua wrote of God's sustaining presence. She wrote this, I saw that I should not fight with beasts, but with the devil. I knew the victory to be mine. On March 7, 202, the Christians were marched into the arena where Perpetua was gored and thrown by a savage heifer. Surviving the first encounter, she crept to the aid of a companion. Shortly thereafter, a gladiator pierced her with a sword. When the trembling youth came at her again, she helped guide his shaking sword to her throat. She was subsequently beheaded. Her devotion to Christ so inspired the Christians in North Africa that she personified Tertullian's famous quote, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Indeed, through the power of her witness, her chief jailer, Pudens, committed himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. The passion of Perpetua, the book, the history of her martyrdom, inspired many Christians to faithfulness during the Middle Ages. And so, as people began telling Perpetua's story, people began looking around and saying, what an amazing thing this woman has done. Let us venerate her and lift her up. And Augustine said, well, wait a minute. We need to be careful about venerating her to the equivalent status of Scripture. And I want to tell you something about Perpetua. Perpetua's faith that she had and what she was able to do was not something that she had in and of herself. She also was inspired by the stories of others, but she was weaned on the stories that we read here in the Word of God. The same stories that you read in Daniel chapter number 3, the same stories that you were told as a child when you sat in Sunday school class and a Sunday school teacher communicated to you the great stories of David as he slew a giant and of these three 
three men as they stood in the fire, these stories have inspired literally millions of Christians to be willing to go to their death as they were willing to sell themselves out for the Lord Jesus Christ. In the face of stories like this, we must consider our text. Even women like Perpetua were inspired by Holy Writ, and they were weaned on the stories of three men in a fiery furnace. In light of these meetings that we see going on, and in light of the, 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 the title that your pastor has given, Sizzling Summer Nights, I'm not sure how that theme will carry through the rest of the way, but we'll see how it goes. I know Pastor Perk got you started off uh, last Sunday. I saw his name was, was first, and I, I was wondering, you know, that probably a poor choice to get things started, but um, the, uh, we appreciate Pastor Perk and his work uh, over there in Westgate. I wondered what would happen if fire from heaven would fall and ignite and unite us for the furtherance of the gospel. Our homes, our children, our wives, our churches, our workplaces would never be the same. Then the Lord began impressing upon my heart these three Hebrew boys. They were on fire for God. Now, some might argue that these men were not on fire for God, but they were in the fire for God. They would be wrong. The fires of this world never touched them externally but they were kindled with the fires of heaven on the inside as they defied the ruler of the known world and they spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. No, they were on fire for God and that seals the deal. They were never, never uh, in the fire. They were always on fire. And by the way, it was being on fire that led them to stand in the fire. And I'm going to tell you, if you will be on fire for God, ultimately that will lead you eventually to being in the fire at some point. The fires of your faith will be tested. They will be purified at some point. You will find yourself in the midst of a fire at some point in your life and if you are on fire, ultimately that is your destination. You will be find your place in a place of defiance. You will find your uh, place in a place where you're going to have to stand when no one else is willing to stand. And you're going to have to say, this is who I am. This is what God has called me to. This is where God has placed me. And you're going to have to decide at that moment whether you're going to recant or continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Listen, we need men and women who are on fire for God. By way of introduction this evening, I want to share with you some things, some ramifications, some things that, the, that I see here in this passage that will help us all understand a little bit about what the Scriptures teach concerning this matter of being on fire for God. Let me just share that you're in the habit of writing some things down. These things may prove helpful to you. If you're currently going through a fire, if you're in the midst of a fire, or you expect it, listen, I expect to go through a fire. I, I expect to go through, I expect to have my faith tried. I expect to be in, in a position where I, I'm, I'm going to have to make a stand and have to continue to stand where God has called us to. I, I expect that in our pulpits we're going to have to stand. I expect that in our churches we're going to have to stand. I expect that we're going to have to face some persecution before this thing is all over with. I don't think any of us in our lifetimes would have, have ever dreamed that we'd be culturally in the place where we are acknowledging and placing consent on certain types of behavior and sin within our society. I don't think anybody thought marriage would be where it is. I don't think anybody thought that we'd be seeing what we're seeing in our church. I don't think anybody thought that we would be here right now, but we are. And I'm going to tell you, because they have control of our public school system and our universities, we are going to continue to fight this in the generations to come if we don't see somebody that gets lit on fire for God. And so we've got to stand up and say, this is who we are. This is where we're going to stand. Consider the ramifications of being one who's on fire. You know, Jesus told us to count the cost. He told us to measure out what it was going to cost us. Here is what it will cost you if you're going to be on fire for God. First off, a man who's on fire for God may be asked to go through the fire with God. A man who's on fire for God may be asked to go through the fire with God. 
If you're here this evening and you have a desire to serve the Lord, if you have a desire to be used of God, I'm going to tell you what God's going to ask of you. God's going to ask you to go through the fire. But thank God that when we go through the fire, we don't go through that fire alone. When he asks us to go into the fire, we may feel like we're alone. We may not know what God is going to do. We may not know if God's going to rescue us. But when we get into the midst of the fire, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar looked in and said, Hey, didn't we? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But I just thought we just bound three Hebrew boys and threw them into the midst of that fire. And of course, everybody sitting around said, yeah, King, you're right, yeah, good, you're right. Well, how come when I look in there, I see four people walking around enjoying? Look at what he says here in verse number 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. We bound them and put them in. The first thing that Jesus did in the midst of this fire is he unbound them. And he set them free. And they're wandering around in the fire. Can you imagine enjoying this great fire? Oh boy, this is a great fire. I mean, could you think? Um, this is most likely, this kiln was built for pottery of some sort, a very large facility that was used, heated up seven times, and they're just wandering around in there. They're just, they're just excited about being in the fire, and there they are with the Lord. Listen, the, uh, the, the concept here that's being taught is a man who is on fire for God may be asked to go through the fire with God. You may be asked at some point to go through a time of trial. You may be asked at some point to take a stand. You may be asked at some point to take a stand at your workplace. You may be asked at some point to take a stand at your school. You may be asked at some point to take a stand uh, somewhere in public where, where everybody's watching and everybody's eyes are on you. That's the request that God makes of us is that sometimes when we're on fire for God, we may be asked to go through the fire, but thankfully we always go through the fire with him. He never leaves us alone. He never abandons us. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And he comes and he shows up here in the midst of the fire. Secondly, this evening, God's leadership in regard to the fire is often through and not out. God's leadership in regard to the fire is often through and not out. You know, when we begin praying, and when trials and adversity come into our life, one of the first things that all of us pray is, Lord, deliver me from this. God, get me out. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want to be here in the first place. Lord, I, I, I'm not sure I'm capable of facing this. I'm not sure I'm capable of facing this trial. God, you have got to get me out. One of the hardest things that we'll ever come to understand in our lifetime is that God's leadership oftentimes is not out. It's not a matter of rescue. It's a matter of purification. It is a matter of refinement. It is a matter of taking us through the fire that we vehemently say we don't want to see and we don't want to experience and we don't want to go through. And I'm going to tell you, on the other side of that, we will be better people, better Christians, better husbands, better fathers, better wives, because God has taken us through that fire. We've learned to trust Him. We've learned to know that He shows up right on time. We've learned to know that God is not going to leave us behind, that God is going to be one who's going to continue in our lives to be faithful, and as he has proved himself to be faithful to us so we can be faithful to him. God's leadership oftentimes is through. I think of Job. I think of the great men of God. Think of a, a, a man of God that did not go through a difficult time, was not led through the fire. God uses these things. Job said, when I am tried, he said, I shall come forth as gold. God's going to purify my character. God's going to reveal my character as I go through this fire. Thirdly, this evening, God's leadership, God's presence is never, as clo never closer than when we are in the fire. God's presence is never closer than when we're in the fire. In John chapter number 15, there's the passage of, the, of Jesus telling us about, he says, I am the true vine and ye are the branches. 
and he begins talking about the purging and purifying process as he goes and he said every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and then he goes on and talks about how the, the, the father is the husbandman he's the one that keeps the vineyard and how he's responsible and, and, I, and none of us like the pruning process None of us like to, to have our, our limbs clipped. None of us like to, to be purified in that way. But I'm going to tell you, as, as, as the husbandman is pruning us, he's never closer to us than when he's pruning. He's never closer to us than when we're in the fire. We'll never sense his presence closer. We'll never know him more. We'll never know him more deeply than when we do, when we're going through the pruning process, the purifying process, when we're in the midst of a, of a difficult fire ourselves because he comes close to us in those times, closer to us than he ever is in any other part of our lives. People who shun those types of trials and want God out, listen, we don't know what we're missing. We don't know what we're giving up. Listen, we often and tell you, Lord, I want out. I don't want to. I don't want to experience this. But what God says is, I want. Not only do I want to take you through, but as I take you through this whole trial, as I take you through this difficulty, I am going to manifest myself and be closer to you in these moments than you have ever experienced my presence at any time previous to this. And that is the desire should be the desire of every child of God. Lord, whatever it takes to bring me closer to you, Lord, whatever it takes to bring me closer to your likeness, even if that means a fire then you just, you just bring it to me. Fourthly, here in our text, a person who has no fire for God will never be recommended for the fires with God. You say, well, preacher, I, I don't have trouble with fires in my life. I mean, I... Things are pretty easy. I, I live pretty well on Easy Street. My Christianity is pretty much polish it off on Sunday. You come to church, sing some songs, shake a few hands, put on a smile, and go back into the work week. I don't have a lot of fires in my life. I mean, you know, is that really necessary? I'm reminded once again of Job. I preached a message some years ago on this subject, when God prepares a fish. You do realize that in that first chapter of Job, many of us, and I hope that our Sunday school teachers are telling the story correctly, it was not, it was not the devil that picked out Job. It was God who picked out Job for the matter of testing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to be perfectly blunt and honest with you tonight. That doesn't excite me very much. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make me just do the country two-step and just get gleeful about my salvation. The fact that God, at some point, if I'm living for Him and I'm doing what He's supposed to want, the fact that God could choose me and pick me and place His hand on me and saying... He's ready. Hey, listen, I'm not ready. That'll be my response when it starts coming. That's your response if you're honest. All of our responses are the same. God, I'm not, I don't know what made you think that I'm ready, but God, I'm obviously not ready. I am so not ready, so unprepared for this. God, just leave, just... And maybe in another few months, maybe another couple years, we are not ready to face something like this. God, just just remove me from the fire just for a little bit. You know, I, I've just I've just not I've just not done the whole uh, protect myself. I don't have listen. I don't have the right clothes for a fire. Yeah, I, I'm just not prepared for that, ladies. I'm not sure they have the right shoes picked out for a fire. You know, the, the, you know, a, a fire will have to have the right kind of outfit. And I've got to make sure I have the right outfit with the right shoes. I'm going to have to have the right accessories. <laughs> All of us want to be able to choose and control when we go through. But here's the thing. A man who's on fire for God gets the recommendation of God for the fire. But if you have no fire, oh, your Christianity is going to be easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy. You're gonna, it's going to be smooth sailing for you. 
You say, well, then that means, then that means it's just better for me to kind of live this lukewarm, tepid kind of life. That means it's just better for me not to, not to put myself in that situation at all. If I can just kind of, kind of skirt it, you know, kind of make everybody else think, dress the part, look the part, talk the part, make everybody think I love God, and just kind of get by through this life without having those fires, oh, that's what I want to have. That's the kind of Christianity I want. You don't know what you're missing. Listen, God's presence will never be real to you. You'll never know Him in a deep way. Your faith will never be strengthened. His faithfulness will never be proven. Listen, God wants to put us through those fires, not because He delights in torturing us, because He delights in driving our Christianity and our roots deeper in the Lord Jesus Christ, because He wants us to know Him him in a real and genuine way and he wants us to be as real as the very flesh on our bones and he wants to manifest himself in a real way so if you really don't want to know God just go ahead and live that lukewarm type of Christianity and you'll be fine the fires of this life next the fires of this life will purify our character in such a way that we may stand tall in the fires of eternity. One day, every one of us are going to stand before the Lord Jesus. Jesus said very clearly in the book of John, He said, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The Scriptures are very clear. As it is pointed unto man, once that I after this the judgment, every one of us in here will stand before the Lord Jesus. If we are saved, if we know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, then we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. If we are unsaved, we will stand at what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment. Nevertheless, all of us will stand. Have you ever wondered what it's going to be like when the eyes of fire and judgment look through and reveal every secret thing everything that is hidden within us that we refuse to give to Him, when we stand before the Lord who, with whom there's no excuse, that there's no response, there's no words to be able to express to Him why we didn't or why we couldn't. When all excuses are removed, and every dark and secret thing is revealed, and you stand before the piercing eyes, the fire of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, even, even the judgment seat, according to the Apostle Paul, the Bible says that our works will be tried, whether they be gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, the concept of fire depicts the matter of judgment, even at the judgment seat. We'll stand before Him and we will give an account, every one of us, face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ who died for me. In that moment, what will give me the ability to stand before Him and for, him, for me to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful. That's what we all want to hear. You say, what allows me to have that moment? You pass the fires of eternity by passing through the fires of this life. When you survive the trials and the difficulties that God sends your way, when you trust Him and you find that through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus, I have learned to trust in God. When you get to the end of life's journey and you have passed through the fires and navigated them successfully, at that moment, we'll be able to stand confidently before the Lord Jesus and look Him face to face. The fires of this life will purify our character in such a way that we may stand tall in the fires of eternity. And then lastly, the fires of earth do not create heavenly character. They simply refine it. The fires of this earth do not create heavenly character or godly character. They simply refine it. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't, weren't spiritual derelicts who were hanging out, not reading their Bibles, and not praying. They weren't guys who were like, you know, well, we haven't been to church in weeks. And then all of a sudden they heard the music. I'm going to tell you, if they hadn't been to church in weeks and they hadn't heard, and, and if they heard that music or if they hadn't been praying and talking to God, if they did not have a living, vibrant relationship with their God, when that moment came, I can tell you what they'd have done. They'd have bowed just like everybody else. But they had character. They had character that was already, I love Daniel 6. Flip over there to Daniel 6 for just a moment. Daniel 6. Much the same thing happens to Daniel as happened to the three men in Daniel 3. In Daniel 6, an edict is made. The only way that they can find an accusation against Daniel is to make a law about his God. They've got to make a law about his God. Man, I wish, I wish that we lived with that kind of character. That if somebody were going to convict us, if somebody were going to find something to point to in our lives, they'd have to convict us of being a Christian. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is, the first for the first time, he goes to pray. He goes to pray just like, like he had been before, but he goes to pray under a new edict. He goes to pray under a new command. And notice what Daniel 6 and verse number 10 says. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God these four words, as he did aforetime. He didn't go in to pray after the edict was signed to prove that he was a Christian, that proved that he loved God. He had been proving he loved God all along, and when the decree was signed, he just kept on doing what he was doing. The same thing with Daniel back in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not trying to prove to the king that they were godly men. They weren't trying to prove to the king that they had enough guts and fortitude to stand and not bow. They were trying to impress everybody else around them they already had character and when the fires came that character was revealed it was purified they didn't choose that moment to step out they already stood out and as a result of the fact that they had character they passed through the fires that God had gave them now there are several things here and this is one of those I'll just chop it off what am I supposed to be done okay you don't want to say that to me. But I love you anyway. I want you to see a few things. I want you to write down some things. I'm going to give you the, the outline here that I have so that you can write it down because I think these things are all notable to note of them. Notice with me, if you would, in Daniel 3 and verse number 12, I want you to see their defiance to the command. Their defiance to the command. They defied the command of Nebuchadnezzar. This was necessary for them to be able to stand. Now, we'll come back to this in just a moment. In verse 13, I want you to see their dedication to continue. Their dedication to continue. Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded, and they brought these men before the king. They said, you know what? We're going to continue doing what we have been doing. We're not going to stop doing what we have been doing. I can imagine the conversation on the way to the furnace. Can you? Hey, Shadrach. Actually, they would not have called each other that. They would have gone by their Hebrew names, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. And Hananiah, um, you know, we're, we're headed up there. When he gets there and he asks us, what are we going to do? Well, I don't know, but you, you know Nebuchadnezzar in this image. He loves this image. He obviously loves himself. He's built this huge image of himself. When we get there, he is not going to be happy. Oh, absolutely not. We're not being summoned there because he wants to give us a medal of commendation. Michelle, what do you think? Well, I think we're in hot water. And very soon, we're going to be in the midst of a furnace. What do you think we ought to do? I think we ought to just continue the way we've been since we got here. God hasn't let us down. He didn't let us down with the eunuchs. He didn't let us down with our diet. He didn't let us down so far. He's promoted us and he's put us here. Let's, if he's not abandoned us, we're not going to abandon him. 
And so their dedication to continue in verse 13, verses 14 through 18, their declaration of confidence. They said, we don't know what's going to happen here, but we do know this. It doesn't matter what you do or what you say. In fact, if you look at this passage, what's interesting to me is he, go, he says, okay, he says what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the second opportunity. And by the way, the world will always give you the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. They're not going to stop with just one opportunity to bow. They're going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming. They're not going to stop. So you better strengthen your resolve now because you're going to get multiple opportunities to, to be, betray Christ. You're going to get multiple opportunities to say no and to walk away from your faith. You're going to get multiple opportunities to deny that you know the Lord. Multiple opportunities, not just one. But when the second opportunity was given, I, I've always looked at this passage. I didn't notice this until I was reading it just a few months ago. But I was looking at this passage, and I always thought when that, that, you know, and I'd always preach it this way. They brought him before him, and, and Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, we're going to give you another opportunity. And they, and they struck up the band again, all those instruments. They struck up the band again, and then, and then and they, they didn't bow a second time, and he threw them in. You know what? That's not true. They never got to the second time. He told you, he said, he told him, he said, now I'm going to give you another opportunity. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You don't need, you don't even need to, you don't even, you need to strike up the instruments. It won't matter. It's not going to make any difference. We're going to stand where we stood, even if the music plays two, three, four, or five times. We're not, we're not moving on this. We're not going to change. And they made their declaration of confidence. Our God is able to deliver us. And then in verse 19 through 23, their decision with consequence. They made a decision and the consequence is that they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. And then in verses 24 through 30, their deliverance with confirmation. The Son of God shows up in the midst of the fire and confirms that their decision is right. Now back up with me into these first part. I want to show you verse 12 and close out here. I want to look at their defiance to the command for just a moment. Now, if you read this chapter, read this, read this book, in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in chapter 2 of an image of himself with different metals. And what God is doing is in this dream, he's allowing these four different types of metals to talk about the four great empires. Babylon being the first, then after that Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then the Roman Empire. And he's using that. God is showing Nebuchadnezzar really one thing. Nebuchadnezzar, you're just, you're, you're just a flash in the pan, son. He says, when you, I was here before you got here, and I'll be here long after, and I'm the one that sets up kings, and sets up thrones, and sets up empires, and I'm going to be around a long time after you're around. In chapter number 3, Nebuchadnezzar says, so you think that you know uh, about my kingdom? Let me show you my kingdom. And he takes the same image from chapter 2 and builds a gold image, all of gold. By the way, the gold in chapter 2 represented Babylon. He builds an image entirely of gold of himself and sets it up to worship. This is a indirect defiance to Almighty God. He is trying to let God know that you don't know best. You don't, you're not going to tell me when my kingdom's going to going to come up. You're not going to tell me when my kingdom's going to end. I am going to tell you. And so in that arrogance we reach this passage where these, all these instruments are being played and as these instruments are being played the, the desire of Nebuchadnezzar is everybody bows to the image that he has set up of himself. And so these three Hebrew slaves were not allowed to bow according to the law of Moses because it was idolatry. They could not bow to this idol because it was in defiance to God. Now, some would argue that they should have obeyed the king so that they could live peaceably. Doesn't the Bible say that we should live peaceably? Just don't cause trouble. Just don't be a troublemaker. Listen, the Bible teaches us the principle, the law of higher powers. The highest power that there is in the universe is Almighty God. We read in Acts chapter number 5, when those in the magistrates were around and told Peter and John to stop preaching, they said we should obey God rather than men. When man's laws try to trump God's laws, the law of higher powers kicks in and every believer is bound to obey the laws of God more than the laws of men. Now, Christians are becoming weak in their convictions. 
and they're willing to let many things slide so they don't make waves. We've assuaged our guilt with cultural catchphrases. Have you heard this? Well, just live and let live. As long as they don't bother me, I don't see the problem in it. They say things like, to each his own. Or, they're not hurting anyone. I love this one. Oh, we have to choose our battles wisely. You know what that means? That means I am scared to go into this battle with these people, and so it's better that I just back off. We use these catchphrases to assuage our guilt, to make us feel better about the fact that we don't want to stand for anything. Now the Chaldeans wanted to change the young men so that they began to reflect their new surroundings and culture. They said, okay, this is what we're going to do. In order to get these guys to the place where they're going to be willing to bow, we've got to change some things about them. Nebuchadnezzar was a genius. He began in chapter number one assimilating these young men into the Chaldean culture. It was this that acted as the preparation for the bowing in chapter number three. He didn't just throw out there and say, oh, you just got to bow. You know, what he, you know what he did? Slowly, he began putting things into them that they didn't have back in, back in Israel. He slowly began changing the culture, changing their surrounding, changing things about him, changing who they're getting educated by. Slowly he began changing those things so that when the opportunity for bowing came, these men would be much more willing to capitulate and bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. Turn back with me to chapter 1. I'm going to show you the four things that he did there real quick in Daniel chapter number 1. Four things that... that that Nebuchadnezzar did in order to get these Hebrew boys prepared. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it was, well, I, I, the way I look at it is sort of like taking meat and tenderizing it. They're taking the fresh meat from Israel and he's just going to pound it. And he's going to pound it and he's going to make it malleable in his hands. And he just knows that by the time that he gets to an image, these guys are just going to bow like everybody else bows. By the way, if you read Daniel 3, the people that are gathered in this particular place are assembled from all nations all over the world. Every place that Nebuchadnezzar has, has already conquered are all gathered in one spot. The Bible says all nations, all tongues, all these people are gathered together. And what he has successfully done with every single one of these groups is bring them to a place where they'll be willing to pow the second he offers up the image. But something was different about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Something was different about them, and something was different about their God. Now, what, what process did he use? Let me show them to you here in Daniel chapter number 1. Notice with me what happens here in verse number 9. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Now, Let's, let's begin here. The first area that, that Nebuchadnezzar began to attack was, the, was in the matter of their lineage. Their lineage. So I don't get that. You do realize that when Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were brought to Babylon, what they, where they were put, they were put with the eunuchs. Now, one of the things that they did, one of the main thing that made a eunuch a eunuch was the fact that he could not procreate and he could not have children. The first step of Nebuchadnezzar's plan to assimilate people groups was to remove their ability to pass on the covenant and to pass on to their descendants the truth that he knew they wanted to to their children. He made sure it was one generation and one generation only. I'm going to tell you, that is exactly what is happening in the United States of America. That is one of Satan's main ploys. He wants to neuter the New Testament church. He 
wants to remove our ability to procreate. He does not want us duplicating ourselves. And as a result, he gets us in a position where he stops us from trying to pass on our faith to our children and anything he can do to keep us from spreading our seed and doing other things like planting other churches and sending missionaries out and bringing unity to the house of God. Any way that he can stop that lineage from taking, uh, taking place, anytime he can stop the heritage from moving forward, he's going to do it. Secondly, not only was his lineage, he, he messed with their logic. Verse 10, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces who are worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then notice what goes on to say. They're, they're talking about this meat here. And I want to show you what is said here in um, verse number 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. Look at this. And whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. He says, what we want to do is we want to change the way they think. If we can change the way they think, we can manipulate their minds. We don't want any free thinkers. We don't want any Hebrew thinkers. We don't want any Christian thinkers. And we certainly don't want any Bible thumpers. So what we need to do is change the very way that they approach life. We're going to rewire their logic altogether. I'm going to tell you, that is happening here. We may not be in concentration camps. And we may not have, have be in a place where uh, many of the Jews were back under Hitler and Stalin. We may not be in those types of positions yet. But I'm going to tell you, we are in a position where we are freely giving our children to a group of people who want to rewire their thinking and logic altogether. What they want to do is make sure there's no continuity. So they want to neuter them. They want to deal with this matter of lineage. Then they want to deal with the matter of logic and say, we're going to teach them how to have a different philosophy. We're going to change their doctrine. We're going to change their convictions. We're going to make them believe the way we believe. And then he says the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Then he deals with their language. He says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to change the way they talk. We're going to, we're going to neuter their speech. Listen, we've got the politically correct police that are out there today. They want, to, they want to change everything about the way we have discourse in public life. They want to make sure that we don't say anything that's... And by the way, they, they want to make sure we don't say anything that's offensive. The gospel's going to bring offense. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. He said, this matter of the gospel is going to divide households. It's going to divide father and son and mother and daughter. It's going to divide one from another. He said, this, this whole matter of the gospel is a dividing place. And Nebuchadnezzar says, we need to change that. We need to make sure that their language, the way they talk, we want them to talk like us. We want them to learn our language and our manner of speech. And so he attacked their language. And then fourthly, He changes their label. Verse 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. He basically swapped labels on them. He said, this, these names represent your God. These are no longer your names. We're going to give you names to honor our gods. And so... He switched the tags. The devil knows that if he can remove the thing which makes us distinct, the thing which makes us children of God, the things, the label that we wear, then certainly he can have his way with us. We are all, listen, we are all being conditioned. Right now, as we speak, we are all being conditioned that when we hear the music, he wants us to bow. The question is this. Will you be one who's on fire for God? Will you stand? Will you stand when the music is played? Would you bow in prayer? Father God, we love you. 
and thank you so much for your love for us. Dear God, I pray for this church and this people and this pastor. I pray, God, that we would not succumb. I pray, God, that we would not bow. I pray, God, that we would not find ourselves in a position where we've been conditioned by society to bow to the idolatry that it is presenting to us. Father, we, we are in need tonight, great need as a nation, great need in our churches. Lord, I, I don't want to see our church. I don't want to see this church. Lord, we need to stand. I pray, God, that we would put in place some measures to protect us. And that we would be willing, if necessary, to go through the fire, if that's what you call us to. Strengthen our resolve and use us for your glory. Do a great work here. Continue to put your hand upon this place. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the glory. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart this evening. How are your convictions holding up under the pressure? How are you holding up under society? When God calls you to go through the fire, are you going to try and get out immediately? Or are you going to allow that moment to be used to deepen your faith and understanding of God? He'll, he'll not leave you. He'll not forsake you. He wants his presence to be ever closer to you in those moments. Maybe you're currently in a fire. Maybe you see one coming. Maybe you realize that you're allowing yourself to be conditioned by society to bow when they play the music. Maybe you just want to come and ask the Lord tonight for discernment. Dear Father, move in my heart and help me to know when it's time. If God has spoken in your heart tonight in just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to do business with God. I'm going to turn the service back over. And if God has spoken in your heart, you do business with Him. Father, I pray for those who are here tonight. I pray, God, for your work Lord, I, I pray, God, that you would strengthen our resolve and help us, God, to get on our knees where we can accomplish the most good. Now we give you the praise and the glory for what you're going to accomplish in the next few moments. But we ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet, heads bowed, nice close. Brother, if you would come. If God has spoken to your heart, you do business with him this evening as the Lord directs you. Take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages for Thee Take my silver and my gold not a might would I withhold, not a might would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be only always all for thee ever only all for thee
for several that are still here and who are still praying. The great message is spot on. That's America. That's where we are, We're being reconditioned. We're going to sing one more verse, and maybe you just want to come down and say, Lord, give me the strength to stand. I'm making a commitment tonight that I will stand and that I'm going to do the things to build my character before the fire comes. One more verse. This verse is for you. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. The great message tonight. Let's thank Brother Wiley for being here, Pastor Wiley. Thank you for that message. I think that was about four sermons in one. There was just four outlines there, and that was awesome. Jotted them all down. Just thankful for that. The time that you put in for those messages. I don't know if you understand how much time goes into preparation for a message. And uh, I understand that one. There was a lot of preparation. We appreciate you being here. We're going to change things up just a little bit while these guys get ready. If I could have our ushers be seated. And you may be seated as well. I'm going to ask Brother David Hall to come at this time. And just give us a little bit of an update on our Faith Promise missions. And uh, then we'll go right into our offering. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, quick note, slight change. We're trying to get more exposure to our Missionary of the Week, so we're moving it from a Wednesday evening to a Sunday evening, so hopefully next week we'll have the screen working so you can put a face with the name. But our Faith Promise pledge this year to date is $22,092.09, and given to date is $23,632.34. So you're doing a good job, church. Keep it up. Praise the Lord. Our missionary of the week this week is Jer uh, Brother Jerry and his wife, Linda Baker. As you remember, we've been praying for him. He went in for surgery this past Thursday at 5.30. He's here in Bradenton at a local hospital. And he came through the surgery well to replace a bad valve in his heart. Uh, he's in uh, ICU right now recovering, but they expect him to be released in a couple days. So we thank you for that and for your prayers. I'd like to personally thank the Dorcas ladies for all their hard work during the uh, yard sale and for the money they raised almost nine hundred dollars for missions so ladies thank you for that and uh, appreciate that and amen it's going for a great cause and that is support mission let me give you a quick update on their ministry uh, pray for them this is their uh, time of the year as we know in this uh, area of the country their hurricane season and they're there in the caribbean caribbean radio lighthouse their primary focus here is to get the gospel across the airways They've made some updates in their equipment, their technologies, their operating system. They've had some people come down that are, are good technical, and they have uh, are able now to broadcast the gospel and the word of God 24 hours a day, which we thank the Lord for. Uh, they've been busy doing some vacation Bible schools, going to the market, preaching, going to local churches and singing, and, and so forth and so forth. And they've seen 28 young people saved during that time, which we praise the Lord for. Uh, the biggest thing you can probably pray for them about is their cost of the electric. Uh, the cost to run the radio ministry is approximately four to five thousand dollars a month in their electric bill. So that's quite substantial, as you can see. But uh, if you could continue to pray for them and, and thank you for their work, their health, and again, Jerry and Linda Baker and the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Pastor Paul. Thank you so much. Pray for our missionaries. I hope that you do that. You keep their faces and their names in front of you. Oftentimes, as we get ready to pillow our heads here, they're uh, across the country, away from family, and they're serving the Lord, and it's such an important part of our ministry here in St. Petersburg as we support them. Well, we're going to pray, and then our usher is going to take two offerings tonight. The first one will be tithes and offerings, and the second one will go to the Wileys, and we appreciate them and their being here. So, guys, we'll do one song, but two offerings. All right, Lord, we do thank you for the message we heard, and Father, we thank you for the messenger, and Father, we pray that you'll bless them in their work in Palm Harbor. We thank you for them. Lord, bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen.
I was a fool to wander astray, straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right, praise the Lord, I saw the light, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen. Thank you very much, guys. Three announcements and we'll be dismissed tonight. Um, the first announcement is next Saturday morning. We're going to meet right here at the church at 9 o'clock. We'll meet with Brother Tyler and we're going to go over to Brother Wiley's church and help them with some canvassing or whatever they'd like us to do. So make sure and be here. We took a group over to uh, Westgate uh, this past Saturday. and we, we did a lot of VBS uh, flyers for them. So uh, please be a part of that. Uh, this morning we talked about blessing others. And uh, this is a great way for you to do that. Um, we've got a teen conference coming up on August 2nd. That's this coming Friday. Um, if you have any questions about that, if you're a parent, come see me. Your teens know all about it, and they should have told you everything by now, I'm sure. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, we're going to be starting a uh, men's, uh, men's prayer time. It's here at 6 a.m., so if you can be here for that, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate it. Prayer is so important, and uh, we've got we've to make sure that we're setting apart times to pray uh, for God's protection in this country and in our church and uh, for God to uh, set us on fire. Well, let's do this. Let's stand tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Please get around and meet the Wileys. We're so glad that you're in church. Pray for our pastor. God bless you. You're dismissed. Come get ice cream in the Barnard Hall. Come get ice cream.